Have you on. So that's like a small disclaimer. The whole process is still <laughs> learning process for people who know Secure Boot. And the more you know that, the more you know that you know nothing, basically. Uh, so this will be the agenda, and I promise I'll try to keep it in time so I won't hold people for lunch. So uh, I work as a, cyber senior, a senior cybersecurity officer in the Irish Center for High-End Computing here in Ireland. Uh, we are a research center that provides a, a high-performance computing services for all research institutes here. We are funded by the government. We are part of the university. Uh, I started my Linux and open source journey around the year 2002. I've uh, been Linux professional sysadmin for over 18 years now, and then I'm volunteering and a part of the Rocky Linux release engineering team. I'm mainly focusing at the moment for Secure Boot, SIG HPC, and SIG Alt Arch, and SIG Kernels. Uh, and I'm a board member of the RSF and Rocky Linux uh, project, and Peridot also, I'm a little bit into ham ready, or two for ready, as I call it, since I don't eat ham. Um, so, <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit, take a step back about how Secure Boot started. Uh, so the UFI uh, released a specification, which is, it used to be called back then EFI version 2, around 2006, and I thank uh, Vincent Zimmer for correcting my information regarding the dates for the history, because there is not too much documentation about how this whole thing started. Then Microsoft started pushing uh, a Windows logo program, or what used to be called the Windows logo program, which required hardware vendors to be able to run Windows 8 to have Secure Boot enabled. Uh, there was some information that's not 100% clear to me. There was a discussions that for specific architecture like ARM, you can't disable Secure Boot, and then they went back and they disabled this feature, so now user can enable or disable Secure Boot, but there is a lot of back and forth here. There was lots of panic, maybe until like 2015, lots of the people in the open source and Linux community was saying, okay, Basically, Microsoft is trying to lock down running Linux in any hardware that has Secure Boot. Uh, Fedora 18, CentOS 7, Ubuntu 12.04 was the first, was one of the first that starts releasing Secure Boot and Shem. Uh, there was a lot of frustration when you have a third party driver that, like any of the graphics driver that outside of the kernel tree, won't run because you have Secure Boot and your option either disable Secure Boot or build your own kernel or sign your own driver, load your certificates, and we, we will come to that later. But the current state for how the Secure Boot community is working is very great. There is lots of collaboration between people from Microsoft, Oracle, OpenSOSE, Red Hat, uh, Debian, Canonical, and th there is loads of coordination now between the Shem and the Grub developers and Microsoft, so there is no more um, non-visibility of what's coming next regarding to framework development with the hardware. So what is Secure Boot? Secure Boot basically is a layer that tries to protect you from uh, running malicious code into your operating system, before your operating system, so like the boot kits and so on, which is great, and we will see now how it works. So. You have a set of keys that usually shape with your firmware. There is usually one master key that is called the platform key, which is usually related more to the hardware vendor. And then you have something called kick that might be one key or multiple keys, which is key exchange keys. And then you have two types of databases, DB and DBX. DB will have what the firmware is allowed to load, and DBX will have what the operating system cannot load. That's in theory, most hardware will be shipped with those sets of keys pre-configured and then installed. And then Secure Boot and the framework need to start a chain of trust. The whole chain of trust is based on the um, public key infrastructure within the framework. So the platform key will sign whatever kicks that there, the, uh, the key exchange key. The key exchange key will sign a database that includes a specific certificate that then will sign your first boot loader. Or will sign a database, which is DBX, that will prevent specific hashes and certificates from loading in your firmware. In practical, at the moment, the kick database, for example, within most of laptops that will run Windows, will have a, a Windows certificate. And then 
the Linux community need to submit a specific first load, uh, first, first stage bootloader to Microsoft getting signed and then loaded into your operating system. That key exists in the DB of the firmware, the Microsoft keys. We will also will get this uh, into details in a little bit. But don't mix the DB and DBX with the actual shim DB and DBX. So shim is what Linux community and open source community wrote to be able to boot a first stage uh, bootloader on your machine when you have Microsoft keys. For one reason, Grub2 is under GPL3 and it can't be signed unless you would release your signed keys and Microsoft and other people will not be signing the, will not be releasing the actual private part of your public key for the public because that will defy the whole idea of having a secure boot kind of concept. Then there was another aspect being added which is called the SPAT, which is Secure Boot Advanced Targeting, um, which is a metadata that you, you put on top of your EFI loaders and will have more information about this software that you are running, like the version, uh, some uh, URL or email, but most importantly is the second column which is a global version. And that also will allow the EFI and Secure Boot to disable specific loaders or specific version based uh, on their global generation. As you can see here, we have shim version two, for example. So that's allow mean that we cannot run anything that says shim version one. And distros use that to revoke malicious um, or vulnerable bootloaders that's been already released to be running anymore in your uh, operating system. The DBX and, and DB within shim introduced as a, um, how you call it, a reaction to the grub boot hole bug, where basically there was a, um, I think around eight security bugs in a grub at a certain point, and that required all grub hashes to be added to the DBX within the firmware, which is basically took half of the NVM, uh, NVRAM that assigned in the firmware to be able to load um, or forbid hashes. So Shem now has their own DB and DBX. Okay. Okay, so why should you use Secure Boot? So security is not a luxury, it's a mandate. You have, as, as long as there is security you can use, you have to use it. So for end user, it will protect you from boot kits. It will give you control over your, uh, if you bind it to load, and that's happen when organizations basically wipe the firmware or load their own sets of keys inside the firmware to make sure that you can run only a specific if EFI that they wrote. Most military will be doing that. They will not leave it uh, with these stock keys. Also, you as a developer, you may not want any kernel to load or any grub to load unless you build it and you compile it so you can build your own small secure boot infrastructure. And whenever you have your distribution, whatever the distribution is, you can load your kernel your keys, and you make sure that this laptop will only load your uh, stuff. For distros, it makes, we try to make uh, end user life much more easier. Also, it allows us to be able to actually prevent vulnerable EFI and um, um, both loaders to load on the operating system. For example, if now we found out that we had a bug in Grub that's been released, we can use Secure Boot to disable this grub and tell the users in advance, you need to upgrade the grub because at certain point this grub will not boot uh, anymore. Okay, so let's talk now about the process of how a distro can achieve Secure Boot. And that's a little bit of a mix between technical and non-technical. Most of the obstacle in Secure Boot are actually non-technical. So they are all more about process governance and your procedures to actually be able to sign and build secure boot. So <clears throat> we will talk about the technical part first. So in high level, you need to have a FIPS 140-2 level two operation environment. And there is a little bit of discussion regarding the operation environment because some will tell you enough to have the keys are stored in HSM that is FIPS 140-2 level two certified. But we prefer if the whole environment is FIPS certified. Then you need to generate your own distro keys as we talk. Some distros will prefer to go with extended um, uh, validity certificates 
other than building their own CA and having a, a self-signed CA. Then you get your shim and you put your CA within this shim. Then you split your certificates and put them within your kernel, grub, FWD, and shim as well again, and whatever other EFI binaries you are going to load, compile and sign your packages without shim. Now you need to get this shim signed by Microsoft. Otherwise, that's great. It will boot in your machine if you actually loaded your shim CA into your firmware as we were talking about. Microsoft has some requirements to do that, which is basically, first of all, you need to be registered with their uh, partner program for hardware uh, portal, I think. You need to get your organization to, to be vetted and have an EV certificate. You need to provide your security contacts. You need to fill a shim review form, or it's a GitHub issue, basically. And uh, you go through the shim review process. So the shim review process are being reviewed by a community of Linux developers. Mainly they are shim and grub developers that volunteer their time to do that. They are from most uh, distros, Red Hat, Oracle, OpenSUSE, and uh, I don't want to forget anybody else, Debian, Canonical. And they check actually all your code regarding shim. They only sign grub at the moment, so they make sure that your grub is hardened correctly. They require you to have specific fixes for certain um, CVEs in grub. They make sure that your kernel is have a specific configuration like lockdown and that your kernel also has sp specific patches for CVEs fixes. And then once your shim review is accepted, you get your shim, and of course it needs to be reproducible. Re re so the shim review will try to rebuild again your shim and they need to get again the same hashes. Uh, usually you provide a container file and maybe a side repo where you actually was using the, uh, the packages and the tool sets that you used to compile the shim for. Once your shim is accepted, you go back to Microsoft portal and you, um, you combine your multiple shim if you are signing for multiple architecture into a single cap file, sign that cap file with your, uh, with your EV certificate that Microsoft portal has and submit your shim to Microsoft. Pray and hope that everything will go well because sometimes things stuck in the pipeline <laughs> at the Microsoft portal. So Microsoft will do lots of processing on the binaries. They will compare to make sure that everything is, is running fine. Once every, everything is good, they may ask you a questionnaire, like fill some questions and answer some um, questions about why you are submitting shim and what's, this is other than the shim review. After maybe a couple of weeks, you will get a signed binary from uh, Microsoft, which is basically a shim, including your distro CA, which is signed by Microsoft key, that the pu public part of the certificate within the framework of the laptop or your PC or whatever. You get this shim binary and you drop it into your RBM, start running a lot of tests, make sure you are not gonna break everybody's laptops and nobody will boot. Once you are happy, you can release. So the chain will be firmware will verify your shim, shim has your certificate, your certificate um, or your CA, you have you a certificate from this CA that actually did sign your kernel grub and FWD, whatever other AFI binaries you have, everything will boot. So far so good, but then come the kernel modules. So the kernel modules is, is, is is not and considered a part of the secure boot. So if you have your kernel in lockdown mode, you won't be able to load any kernel modules unless they are signed by the kernel. But the only part that's signed from your kernel for secure boot is actually the kernel image, but not the initramfs or initrd, which is why now there is some discussion within the systemd community for the UKI where they need to combine a, a kernel boot command with the, uh, with the initram FS and the kernel image and have one with a stub and have this signed with, for secure boot. The keys, most of the distros like CentOS and Red Hat and others, they use ephemeral keys while, while they are building the kernels. So your kernel modules are, your, your, your spec file basically generating a key, then they are signing the module and then these keys are gone, but your kernel knows that these keys this, uh, know the keys through something called a mock in your machine, which is 
a machine owner key a database that Shem generates, including some of the kernel keys that you have while you are building your distro. Then you release. That's so far so good. So um, the approach how we did it for Rocky, uh, I sadly kind of volunteered myself to do this. We, I said, okay, I'm going to volunteer to look into Secure Boot, uh, which was a great journey, and I'm still learning a lot of things. Uh, then come the most complicated part, which is finding actually FIPS 140-2 level two uh, environment. The most of the major cloud providers, they do have an HSM service that is FIPS 140-2 level two or level even three certified. However, there is no operation environment that can connect to this HSM that is FIPS 140-2 level two certified and that caused lots of issues and we ended up actually finding a data center where they are FIPS certified and we had hardware there and this is how it is. But again, as I was, I, was, I was chatting with some people who actually wrote some of these requirements, and they were saying, okay, mostly we just require the keys to be in the FIPS environment, not the whole build environment, but there is no confirmation about this. Based on the documentation that's issued from Microsoft, the whole environment needs to be FIPS certified. And we needed to start installing those, um, releasing those packages with Secure Boot, so we went only with a single certificate for kernel grub and FWD. Everything went fine, we submitted shim review for uh, 8.5, I mean, we submitted before 8.5, however, until we got the whole process done, 8.5 being released, and we finally released 8.5 with, um, with a signed shim from Microsoft. Uh, we had to go on to another iteration and we released a newer shim because our shim was based on 15.4 plus some cherry uh, pick uh, get patches that the shim review committee required us to have before the shim reviewing was being released. Now we have shim 15.6 signed. There is shim 15.7 already released and I think within a few weeks we'll have a new shim um, released um, soon. So we went into two phases. First phase we went with a single a certificate, as I was mentioning, uh, we were using a UPKey FIPS 140-2 level two um, HSM module, and we were using PE sign in server and client mode to be able to sign the rest of the binaries, the kernel and grub and so on. So PE sign will talk to the uh, to the UPHSM, get the keys and sign the binaries. But now we move to phase two, which is this is actually the current that we have at the moment. Uh, we still have the self-signed CA for shim. Uh, we start separating the kernel, grub, and FWD uh, certificates. So now basically we have multiple certificate per um, package. And we move to use UPHSM, the, uh, uh, UPHSM FIPS 140-2 level two, which will allow us to be able to use more even uh, certificates or key slots within the HSM module and we are using, we moved to use PE sign tools, SP sign tools. And so far that works fine and give us uh, less headache and now we have more modular of a kind of a networked HSM that we can use even for signing other uh, packages uh, within the secure boot ecosystem that we are building. Okay, so what's next? <clears throat> At the moment in the RESF, we are talking about joining the UFI forums as contributors. Uh, we have, um, we are thinking and talking about signing a other kernels from the from Rocky SIG kernels, which will include kernel mainline, kernel LTS with some uh, uh, configuration patches we are building. We are looking into the uh, PowerPC and the Z system secure boot because those are a little bit more complex and they don't, do the traditional EFI kind of concept of floating uh, packages. Uh, also, we're looking at the ARM64. We never submitted an ARM64 uh, shame to Microsoft because Microsoft has different requirements for that, but we are going to look into that and submitting this, and the aim is to help the SIG Alt Arch to have secure boot running on most of the uh, system of chip uh, embedded hardware if it's applicable. And also we are looking at the UKI from system boot, which is, as I mentioned, the combined kernel with NITRAM, FS, and command line, and system do beat, which is e-boot uh, manager. And we need to automate. At the moment, there is not too much automation happening within this, when this uh, signed, 
which is good and bad because you kind of need to confirm that you are doing things right, but that doesn't mean that it can't be automated and have more monitoring. Uh, in, secure, in secure boot ecosystem, there is a SPAT support being pushed to the kernel patches at the moment, and the NX support for kernel patches. The NX support is a little bit tricky because Microsoft from last November required any shim submit to have an NX support. And there is no NX support at the moment in the kernel, and they won't sign any shim unless it's NX supported. So I know that Debian is the only or they caught the last cycle of releasing shim, and that's NX supported. And I know that they will be backport the NX patches to their Debian, uh, to their Debian um, uh, kernels. Uh, for the SPAT, still under review by the uh, by the kernel uh, uh, developers. Um, so that's to recap. Any questions? Yes. Okay. Is it real? Okay. Is this bad real? It is there. As far as I know, there are still uh, there are still patches need to go in to be able to actually do the revocation correctly. Or um, as far as I know, I'm not 100%. But I know that at the moment you can run things below your SPAT version. But that should be fixed. I hope within the next release. Uh, of, of Shem, which is very interesting because I don't exactly know what the history behind having this path if you can actually use the Shem DB and DBX, because with DBX you can just prevent all your hashes. So the idea also of the go governance here that we were talking about, that you need to keep logs of everything you are, they are doing, everything needs to be logged, all your hash, all your binary hashes need to be stored so you can actually make it easier for you to revoke. But what I know is that the SPAT and the DBX, DB and DBX was a reaction to the boot hole. Uh, but yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. This may be a dumb question, but you were talking about the fact that kernel modules need to be signed uh, if your kernel is signed, obviously, if you're wanting to use them, yeah. is there a way to to um, it, with with the secure boot uh, Rocky Linux release? Is there a way to do kernel either to sign your own if you have out of tree kernel modules? Is there a way to load them up in without having to go through all of this? Uh, yes. There is a way. So the, 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 uh, that's why the kernel module is a little bit confusing because the kernel module is not actually a secure boot feature, but if you have kernel locked down on some patches, it will be a secure boot feature, and kernel modules will not load if you have secure boot enabled. And even I, as far as I remember, there were some things that you need to make sure that the kernel can check that the boot load are actually on our secure boot. However, there is a way that you can load another certificate. So you can sign out of three modules if you want and then load them into your mock uh, tree. But then you will have to do that. The way that this works is some distros will have a specific key that there will be certificate loaded, but it's not used unless it's need to be used for signing an out of tree kernel if they really, really audit it and they want to risk running their distros. Otherwise, it's up to the user user can just build their own kernel and then load this key, uh, load the certificate into their mock uh, database into the machine, and then it will load. I hope this answers your questions. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I guess this is kind of a me catching up question. Um, from what I understand, the shim is was originally developed so that um, you could actually uh, use secure boot with Linux, uh, regardless that uh, it wasn't the whole thing signed at the time. Um, okay, is that is that correct? I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure. I guess that's why it's it. called a shim. Uh, but so, uh, no, yeah. So that you don't have to submit kernel modules. Yeah, to Microsoft. So, 
Exactly, not the whole thing, just yeah. the shim. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm, what does, I mean, f f going through that process, what, what did, did you, uh, what does, I mean, it must be like all the open source operating systems are just doing shims, and what does Microsoft, do you know, do, is there anything like they, is there any feedback from them about that, or they're just like, yeah, uh, whatever, like they don't care? It's not that they don't care. So the, the idea of shim that, as, as the, at the uh, Neil and I think D David? Yeah, David, yeah uh, David mentioned that, so you, so you don't need to push your kernels and so on, but also, you could have just pushed your Grub to be signed by Microsoft, but that can't be happen because the Grub 2 license will allow my, will, will force Microsoft to release the keys, and you don't, don't, don't want to do that. That's why the shim existed in the first place, to be able to submit something to Microsoft so they can sign, and then other Linux distro can load that. At the moment, as far as I know, uh, the shim has hard code only to load Grub 2, and most of the shim reviews will only advise you that at the moment we are only reviewing your shim or your submission if you are only loading grub2 kind of concept. Uh, so that's what the main idea of the shim, that you have something simple enough that submit to Microsoft, very easily audited, and then Microsoft can sign it, and then you can take the chain from there, loading your own certificate and your own key. Also, the same way as when you are loading the keys for, um, like when you put your CA within your, your shim, you can actually utilize the DB feature of shim and have multiple certificates there. And there was a lot of discussion in the community, okay, why just we don't have one shim mm -hmm. that has all distros key, sorry? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was this discussion to have this kind of, of concept. Also, there is now a side, a side tools that's running uh, within shim that actually, uh, I think they just changed the, the name recently, it used to be called CertiMule which basically if we are in Rocky and you, another distro that you want to load your own, uh, only the kernel modules or only the kernel images signed by you, you can give us your certificate and we will sign this CertiMule and then it will be loaded. It's kind of similar to DBDBX, but the issue is DBDBX that every time we need to update this DBDBX, we need to send it back to Microsoft to be signed. So that's why there is this CertiMule um, tool exists. Uh, however, it's not very used yet. Exactly. Any more questions? Yeah. I don't have questions. So are there any more questions? Going once, then going twice. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, So lunch is served or will be served in three minutes. The lunchroom is on this floor just down the hallway. Uh, and we will return here or whatever track you want to be in uh, in an hour at 1.30. Uh, if you come back here, we're going to get a hyperscale update, hyperscale SIG update, followed by uh, an automotive SIG update. So thank you and I'll see you at lunch.